that this is an unusual time and an unusual place and way for us to be meeting, but it is uh, worship no matter where we are and what time it is. And so welcome to worship this morning. I want to invite you to participate fully, even if you are at home in your pajamas. I don't need to know that, first of all, uh, but I really would encourage you to participate in the music and in the singing and the prayers. Um, and the first thing I'm going to invite you to do, I send out a notice, I hope some of you got this and are ready for this, but I'm gonna invite you, in order to make your own space and this own time feel just a little bit different from your norm, I'm gonna ask you to light a candle and maybe keep that candle lit while we worship this morning, and then perhaps you can use that as a reminder to pray uh, during the week as we pray for those who are affected by uh, COVID-19, by this pandemic, all the folks that are um, part of this uh, pandemic. So let me light our candle this morning and open us with a prayer. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we do know that Christ is the light of the world. And there was a moment in Christ's ministry where he boldly proclaimed that we too are the light of the world, and that we are to let our light so shine that others would come to know you, to glorify you in every way. Lord, these days are uncertain, and they are filled with anxiety for so many. Allow us, by your grace, to constantly look to Christ as our light and to be the light for others in big and in small ways, in our own homes, in those few moments when we are out. Allow us, God, to be patient and kind and compassionate and to do so in Christ's name. Gather with us as we worship this morning, that we might worship in spirit and in truth, wherever we might be. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we sing our opening hymn, I would ask that those of you who are watching us online, if you would take a moment, I think it was up on the screen, and if you would simply sign into the comment section and let us know that you are here today. In a few moments, you'll have an opportunity to share some prayer requests that same way, but I certainly would encourage you to engage as much as you possibly can. I would discourage you, however, from putting any comments during my sermon. Um, that would be not a good thing to do, trust me on that. Um, but let's sing together, and I'm grateful for members of our choir who are here. I'm going to invite them to come up. We're going to sing this song, this beautiful chorus, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. You'll see the words up on the screen, and we're going to sing that through two times. So join us, wherever you might be, in singing this beautiful song. Thank you. 
choir. Our creed this morning is uh, one that we use so often in this congregation. And I chose it because it starts with these powerful words, we are not alone. So I invite you to recite wherever you may be this creed together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make it new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. song, my instinct is to stand up. So if you stood up in your own home, because that's just what you do when you sing the Gloria Patri, make yourself comfortable. And this is a time where we are going to gather our prayers together, and this is a great time to use our technology. And so if you want to, in the comments section, if you want to put any prayer requests that you may have, our intercessory prayer team will be meeting. It will probably be a virtual meeting this week. And we promise that we will be lifting up each and every one of your prayer requests. So don't hesitate whenever and wherever you might be watching this to include your prayer requests. But let's now gather our minds and our hearts and our spirits as we pray together. Good and loving God, it would be so easy for us to think that you are hiding your face from us. It would be so simple to say, well, God is simply proclaiming judgment upon the earth in these days. But that is not the God that we know and the God that we experience. For we know you as a God of great compassion and a God of great love, a God who is present with us in our suffering. And so, first of all, God, we give thanks to you for your presence with us in these days and always. You are with us in our joys, you are with us in our celebrations, and you are with us in the valleys as well, in the darker moments, in our anxiety and in our worries. And so as we just proclaimed just moments ago, we are never alone, for we are always in your presence. God, our needs are huge these days. We could number them and maybe even run out of digits. So many people affected by our pandemic. Individuals who are sick, who are in need of your healing. Thousands who have lost their lives and even more who are mourning a great loss. Children who are separated from elderly parents by a window or a door who can only see them and speak through the phone, and yet, God, you find a way, we find a way to be present for one another. On this day, we pray for all of those who are on the front lines of this experience, our, our caregivers, our health workers, the ones, doctors and nurses, who are brave enough, out of necessity, yes, but also out of courage and an oath that they took to always be there for others. God, would you wrap them in protection and allow them to 
find a supernatural strength in these days where exhaustion must certainly be filling their bodies. There are some who are anxious about being out in public and wonder how will they get the supplies that they need. God, would you calm their fears and show us how we might minister to those who are vulnerable at this time. Fill us with compassion and allow us to reach out to neighbors and to friends and to family members who may be in need of our assistance. God, there are folks who are worried about their jobs already gone or wondering when they might get that notice that their job no longer exists. Provide comfort and peace for each of them as well and for all of your people. For whatever it is that's lying on our hearts this day, God, take it and hold it as you promise you will. Hold it close and collect it in your hands. And help us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are not alone, that your grace is sufficient for this day, that your love will conquer anything that the world might throw at us, that there is always resurrection hope. Even in the middle of this Lenten season, we gather because there is resurrection hope. Help us to lean into that. And not only lean into it, God, help us to demonstrate it to others. Allow us, by your grace, to truly be the heart and the hands and the feet of Jesus in whatever way we're called to do that in these days. And let us do it, not in our own strength, but in the strength of your Holy Spirit and with the model of Christ as our guide. Hear our prayers, O God, silent and spoken, whispered or shouted, as we offer to you the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before I read our scripture for today and share a word with you, I, I do want to say a word to our kids. I hope that you're able to see some of this. You're watching maybe with your parents. And I do want to say a word to our kids. First of all, let me say this word, I miss you. Um, it is one of my favorite parts of our, our worship when I get to gather with you and to hear your hearts. And I do miss seeing your face and hearing your laughter and, and, and all the noise you make. I miss that. So make all the noise you need to at home. I know your parents would really appreciate that. Um, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to, in a few moments, be talking about David. David who was made king. David who was the youngest son. He was the smallest of the group. He was set aside almost by his brothers as a nobody because he was the youngest. Some of you know what that feels like. And David's story is a reminder, kids, that we, no matter how old you are, you can share joy and share Christ with others. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Sometime today, sometime this week, make some art for us. Draw a picture of your family. Draw a picture of our church. Draw a picture of whatever brings you joy. And then ask your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa, just ask someone to take a picture of that, your artwork, and instead of putting it on the refrigerator, tell them to post it to our Facebook page because we'd love to see your drawings. And maybe in that way, we can connect with you and see you, and you can bring us joy. As, a, as, as maybe the youngest one in this church, you can bring joy to someone's life. So I'm going to ask you to do that. Um, you can maybe even do that now uh, while you're listening. Do some, some pictures for us, and let's put that up on our refrigerator called Facebook. Now let me share um, with you our scripture for today. It comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, and it is uh, just a marvelous story. 
We're going to read verses 1 through 16. Now when the king was settled into his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall not afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So maybe it's a little unfair that the, we find in the beginning of this passage that the Israelites are in a place that we are not. They are in a place of peace. They are in a place of relative calm in their society, in a place of prosperity. In fact, we read that God had given the people of Israel rest from their enemies. Maybe we wish we were in that place. It seemed to give King David the opportunity to slow down a little bit, to relax a bit, and the ability to notice something he had never noticed before. He was living in a fine palace made of cedar, and yet, the Ark of the Covenant, God's, God's presence among the people, was still in a portable tent, in a tabernacle. So David, naturally, is going to fix this problem. So he tell, tells Nathan, I'm going to build God's house. I'm going to fix what this, this problem we've got here. David thought it was time to build God a permanent structure, a temple. So Nathan tells David, the king, which is probably a good thing to say to a king, by the way, do whatever you want. If you're ever working with a king, that's the word you want to say, do whatever you want. Except that night, God speaks to Nathan. And God gives to Nathan a different message for David, not do whatever you want, but a message that says God doesn't want David to build the temple. It would be Solomon. Solomon, the tenth son of David, who would take on that job. But the one thing God does do that night is God makes a covenant with David. We've been spending our time studying the various covenants of Scripture, and now we come to this covenant that God makes with David. And there are several parts of this covenant. I want to just lift up those essentials. First of all, God says, I will make a house for you. 
God turns David's words on himself. It's an extraordinary reversal, reversal, if you will, of David's intentions. And, and I think when I read that part, when I read this section where David is saying, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do great things for you, God turns it around and says, no, David, I'm going to do even better things for you. And it's a reminder to me that we can never outdo God. So if you have any delusions of that today, let me put those delusions to rest. We can never outdo God. We cannot outlove God. We cannot outgive God. We cannot outserve God. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not called to love. We're not called to give, not called to serve. We are. But we do so in response to God's already giving. And it's impossible for us as humans to outdo God as much as we would love to think we can. This first part of the covenant is a reminder that God is the beginning and source of all that is good. But God goes further in this covenant. And he says, not only will I make a house for you, I will raise up after you your descendant, a descendant who will come from your body, a biological descendant, and I will establish his kingdom. Now this is important because if you remember, to the Israelites, um, lineage was, was critical to the community. Having sons, having a lineage, having someone to carry on your name was so incredibly important. And that promise of descendants echoes the promise given to Abraham. And it is a huge promise to David. And then God says, it will be this descendant who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's, that's a huge promise. That's not only I'll give you descendants, but forever I will, I will establish their throne. That will be an everlasting throne. And then God says, I will be a father to him. This father-son bond is a way of articulating perhaps the closest relational bond known to this community. The bond of father and son, the strongest relationship. God's saying, I will have the strongest possible relationship with your descendants. And notice it's an absolute. God doesn't say, I'll be like a father to him. And he'll be like a son to me. God says, no, I will be father. He will be son. And that indication of constancy is echoed in the next promise. That says, my faithful love will never leave him. Now, if you're a parent or a grandparent, I want you to take a moment and just imagine this. Imagine that you have received a direct promise from God that your child would be loved forever by God and that the love of God would never, ever leave your child. Imagine, as a parent, what that does for your heart. By the way, we do that in baptism, in case you're wondering. Now, I don't know about you, but as a parent, that is empowering and comforting to know that God will never, ever leave your child will never ever stop loving your child. It's an overwhelming peace that comes with that. I, I remember in some of the difficult days of Kaylee's teenage years, um, there was a prayer that I used to pray when she was struggling, when I was struggling, when we were struggling together, and it sounded like this, God, she was yours before she was mine. And I echoed that prayer recently. God, she was yours before she was mine. It was a reminder to me that I could not out-love God even when it came to my own child. Imagine, parents, what that must feel like. And then God one more time says to David, your house and kingdom will endure and your throne will be established forever. After speaking to the parent's heart, God wraps David into a promise. Your house, your kingdom will endure forever. And it's extraordinary. Because God isn't only speaking about Solomon here. He's also talking about Jesus. Almost every aspect of this covenant, almost every aspect of this covenant, with perhaps the exception of when he does wrong, right? That phrase, when he does wrong, can apply both to Solomon and to Jesus. 
We know that Solomon was not perfect and was chastised by God. We know that Jesus bore punishment, but not from God, but from human hands. And not for wrongdoing, but for his willingness to love inclusively and expansively. To serve and include the wrong people, at least the wrong people in the eyes of the religious leaders of the day. The real heart of this passage turns on the word house. David wants to build a house for God. And God turns around and says, I'm going to build a house for you. Now, the the reason this is important is because we're not only talking about a physical house. The the word house in, in the Hebrew means a dynasty, a family, a rule, a kingdom. It could be like the house of Windsor or the house of the Habsburgs or the house of the Rockefellers. It's a dynasty. And God says, you want to build me a physical structure, but I'm going to build you something better. I'm going to build you a kingdom. And this promise is absolutely without condition. Last week, when we talked about the Mosaic Covenant, the Ten Commandments, we heard, if you obey my commands, then I shall be your God and you shall be my people. It's a conditional commandment. And it focuses on the gracious action of God to free us from captivity and our response to that grace. But this covenant, this David covenant or the Davidic covenant is about God doing something new and something quite extraordinary. It's about God doing something forever. Three times it appears in our passage. Your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And I will bless your household forever. God has, for all intents and purposes, signed a blank check over to David. He's radically shifted the the theological foundations of Israel from Moses to David, and then ultimately, as we know, to Jesus. Because Jesus is in the lineage of David. We'll learn that. God has promised the house of David unconditional love. A love that is not dependent on temple sacrifices. A love that originates from God, not from human obedience. A love that will abide forever, and I don't know about you, but forever is a long, long time. And more than anything, God is revealing that in the person and then in the model of Jesus Christ, that full relationship of humanity and God will be brought brought to bear, not on temple or sacrifice, but on relationship, a relationship of love. And that's what I want us to hold on to today because I think it's probably the biggest message of this covenant. God promises forever faithfulness to David and to us. This forever promise can only be completed in Jesus, and that happens not only biologically, but spiritually as well. For only in Jesus do we know the incarnate, divine, in the flesh love of God. Only in Jesus is the covenant complete. But that's another story for another day. For today it's enough that God has promised his love forever. And in these days of anxiety and uncertainty, I'm praying that the foreverness of that promise, the unyielding faithfulness of God, will grant us all peace. A peace that surpasses not only our own human understanding, but a peace that rises above the worry and the disquiet of today. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, help us this day to lean into the foreverness of your promise, to never doubt your faithfulness or your love or your grace because you have shown yourself over and over, God, to be faithful. So allow us, by your grace, to live into that, to be confident in that, and to be strong in that love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to ask the 
choir to come back up and prepare to lead us in our closing hymn, but um, up on our screen, I believe we're going to have a slide. I, want, I do want to say while they're coming up a word about giving. Uh, again, I know we're in very strange times. We're not here um, to pass a plate, but the work of the church goes on. The ministry of the church goes on, and already we're having conversations with our mission teams about how are we going to shift our ministries after after this is over? How are we going to shift our ministries to help those in our community who are going to be profoundly affected by the loss of jobs, the loss of income? And our missions team is already preparing to have those conversations. So let me encourage you to be faithful in your giving to the church. If you're not already giving online, I would encourage you to that way of giving. Certainly you can send a check into the church, or if you want to, even now, pull out your phone and text to give. I think the number is up on the screen as well. Allow our faithfulness to echo the faithfulness of God that is unwavering and faithful. Well, let's join together in singing a closing hymn. Again, if you're joining us from home, feel free to stand up and put that coffee cup down and join us in our hymn, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. You'll see the words up on your screen. join in our closing prayer, a prayer that has taken on new meaning, at least for me in these weeks. So let's pray together. God of the covenant, you are ever faithful. Your love never ends. Teach us your ways and guide us in your paths of love and forgiveness, that we may be witness to your grace and salvation. May the peace of the Lord and the presence of Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Amen.